good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining me for this last session. Uh, I uh, know this is probably one of the last things standing between you and uh, a relaxed evening, so I'll try to make it as enjoyable as possible. My name is Alex, and together with my colleague Xavi, we are both developers at network virtualization company Midokura. And we presented for this afternoon a session on creating containers for network services. So the idea of creating uh, containers for network services, or otherwise said containerizing network services, is to enable certain neutron services, such as, for example, load balancer, firewall, uh, dynamic routing, that is BGP or VPN, making them containers to make them uh, to have them as easily to deploy as possible, for example, in your data center. So the question was why containers is that in many of these, for, for many of these services, we're actually using uh, existing software. For example, for Lbus, we may use HAProxy. For uh, VPN, we may use LibreSwan or OpenSwan. So creating containers for the services is is because we may easily package these applications and make them available at different compute nodes. Now, what do we look at when uh, we want to create containers for these uh, network services? Well, the first thing is because uh, one, of, one of the things is that containers and these uh, network functions have a similar life cycle. So, for example, um, we don't have to have a full-fledged guest operating system running in order to, for example, support uh, firewall or VPN. But on the other hand, uh, we want, for, for example, these containers, these, these uh, services to start up as fast as possible. The second reason is uh, high availability, scalability. So with containers, it's possible that uh, we can uh, move one service from one compute host to a different compute host. For instance, if, you, if we have a problem, if we have to take it out for, man for maintenance. Uh, another reason is resiliency. So uh, by enabling these uh, network functions containers, it's possible to monitor the health. And if there is a problem, then we simply start a new container, a different host. Also, using containers, it's possible to use uh, for the same function multi-vendor solutions. So for example, uh, if you want to use BGP and or firewall, you may use different applications. Depending, for instance, for, for customer, for tenant, you can use an open source uh, software. For a different customer or a different tenant, you could use, let's say, an enterprise version, right? And if the customer is willing to pay more for, to pay the license for that version. And Finally, we want to make uh, uh, deploying these services as easy as possible for the cloud operators. We want to provide them tools for management to migrate containers from across uh, different compute hosts, to set up different policies to manage these, for example, the host, the set of hosts where these containers are deployed. Now, how do we look at implementing these service containers? So starting from the top, you can see that at the first layer, we have different possible services that we can implement as service containers. For example, taking from Neutron, we can use a load balancer, we can use firewall, we can use VPN as a service, and so on. The second layer is the OpenStack Neutron layer. And at this, we have a Neutron plugin that usually interfaces with whatever network virtualization software you use. And the third layer is for now, let's say, an abstract layer that we call service containers. And it is uh, this layer where we provide the actual implementation that translates between the network function, the network service above, and an object that represents that service uh, at different compute hosts. Right? So these, for now, abstract objects called service containers will represent, for example, the type of service that you, to you run their configuration, and where it's supposed to be deployed, and how they interact with, with the virtual network. 
And finally, at the lower layer, at the lower layer, layer excuse me, we have different compute servers, and it is where, where we deploy uh, the services as containers, right? So uh, these compute hosts, they will be connected uh, probably through an interface with uh, uh, the software, the networkization software that you have there, and they will interact with, with the other components, with the other instances, uh, the other virtual components in your virtual network, and so on. Now, to recap a little bit, so the key, key requirements we looked at when we started implementing service containers were scalability. So we wanted to make sure that we can deploy these services as container at compute hosts, so that is, as, as you add more capacity to your data center, adding more computes and supporting more instances, the uh, system also scales out in terms of the kind of services you can provide. Then we want to also have it high availability, that is, whether it is a problem either at the container level or at the compute level, these services can seamlessly transition from one host to, to a different one. Oh, so, sorry. Then we want to monitor the container health. That is, we want to inform tel operators whether there is a problem with the service. Or also to make sure that uh, whatever network virtualization software use, it's, they could detect, for instance, the uh, health of these containers and otherwise move them to a different host. We want to make possible for operators to uh, manage these containers from the container level to groups of containers by applying uh, policies to them. And these policies may include, for instance, container affinity to certain hosts, to certain groups of hosts, uh, to affinity to other containers, or they could have uh, faith sharing with uh, certain ser other services or uh, certain network devices or ports, for example. So how did we implement containers in Midonet? And from now, I start to just explain a little bit what we did in order to enable uh, uh, enabling uh, service functions in Midonet using containers. So just a brief introduction. Midonet is an authorization software started by Midokura and has been open sourced in uh, 2014. And it provides, uh, for example, layer two, layer three virtualization, stateful and stateless NAT, firewall, and so on. And since release 5.1, we've added support for VPN as a service, which we implemented using these service containers. Now, just a brief overview of how Midonet works, so we can easily understand the, the next step that where we go into how we implemented service containers. So at the top, we have uh, OpenStack and Neutron, which interacts through the Midonet plugin with a controller layer. We also call it a Midonet cluster. And this layer is responsible of simply translating uh, the higher level northbound models from, from Neutron to our own uh, Midonet model or southbound layer model in that we store in our own database. For this, we leverage Zookeeper. And at the lower layer, at the lower layer we have uh, different computes. And on each compute, we install uh, different software that we call a Midonet agent. And this is the main software that deals with uh, the packet level t uh, functions in network virtualization. So, the key difference, what distinguishes Midonet, uh, is that uh, we tried with, with this Midonet agent to push the intelligence at the edge. That is, uh, by converting the higher level neutron models into our own Midonet models that we store in a southbound database, it's possible for the Midonet agents to download these, let's say, enriched modified models and apply their own logic in order to make packet processing distributed as distributed as possible. So in this example, if a certain VM or instance from one compute sends a packet to a different compute, the Midonet agent residing at that ingress host will apply whatever transformation is needed, such as 
the packet seems like it's flowing through the virtual topology that we have in green on the right side. And after all this transformation, or we also call it a simulation, is completed, the modified packet would simply be tunneled to the egress host, in this case where we have the second instance or the second VM, VM2. In a little bit of more detail, I just want to mention that uh, with, with, in Midonet we leverage the OVS kernel module. So we have OVS uh, in the kernel, and on the top in user space we put the Midonet agent, right? So what happens is that when a certain instance sends a packet, Midonet intercepts the packet, runs the simulation on it, and then depending on whether the, that packet has to egress it, or the same host or a different host, We'll send it back through, through the kernel, and I would be tunneled at the other host, or would be, uh, would be simply be outputted at the same uh, host if the VM is on the same uh, physical uh, compute. Now, with this brief introduction on Mironet and how it works, how did we implement service containers? So, starting again from the top, so we see we have OpenStack Neutron, we have now our plugin. And here, let's say we have a service. This service can be uh, LBUS, can be VPN as a service, can, will be in the future dynamic routing, of course. And this is something that you either create from Neutron or from Horizon, from the CLI or from Horizon, for instance. And because our plugin interacts with uh, the Milonet controller that we have there on the, on the top, what we do in the controller is simply translate the service that you create from Neutron into a bunch of objects that reside in our southbound model. And these objects, in this case, when you create a new service, we create a port for it where we connect the container. We also create a service container object, and this container object encapsulates the information we need for that container, that is, encapsulates, for example, the service type, uh, probably its version of what kind of software it has to run, and as well its configuration. So, for example, when we launch the service container, well, you know, we have to run this application. It will run like this. This is its configuration and so on. And finally, we also create a third type of object, in which case we call it a service container group. And the purpose for this group is simply to allow cloud operators to have a better control of group, groups of service containers. And this is for reason of applying, for example, scheduling policies or affinity of the containers for different computes or how to manage their life cycle. And I will show later a demo of how this works. So this was the first step, doing the translation. Now, the second step that we, we took was to do some software modification. And these software modifications were, one, to add some additional container service support in our Midonet uh, software running the controller nodes, and also to add support for starting this container, that is, manage the lifecycle of the compute hosts. So we see that we have a container service uh, running on the controller, and several container services running on the compute. So, in a couple of slap, uh, steps, the way this works is, for example, the first step is you create a service from Neutron, right? This gets translated into our, our southbound model through the controller, and we'll store these objects in our southbound database. Then, uh, the controller would uh, notify, for example, which Com compute host would have to start the, the container. So we do this with a scheduling algorithm. The computer starts the controller, at step number three, and then the container at step four will report via the southbound database its status, that is, what it's running, uh, if it's healthy, it's okay, and so on. And at final step, the controller monitors the container status and takes action whenever something is wrong. For example, the container is down, the compute is down, and it, or it, for instance, the operator has modified uh, the policy or has manually rescheduled the container, and so on. So now I'd like to demonstrate to you how this works. 
And before I do so, I just wanted to take a couple of steps explaining a little bit of, a little bit of setup. So for this setup, I, uh, on my laptop here, I uh, started uh, an OpenStack environment, and I'm running uh, a controller, an OpenStack, with OpenStack, with Neutron, the Midonet Neutron plugin, and I also am running the uh, Midonet controller software. And I also have two computes. Actually, I have three computes because the Minonet agent is also running on the controller node. So I can play a little bit with, with the containers. I can show you how I can move the containers from one compute to the other compute. And the virtual topology I'm trying to demonstrate here is a simple one. I have two networks. They call them Mercury and Venus. And they, also, they all have a router. Uh, this would be the tenant router. And they are connected to a public network. And I'm trying to enable VPN on these routers such that the instances that I, I'm running uh, on each of these networks can, can talk to each other through VPN, right? So in the, the implementation of Minonet, what would happen when we enable VPN on these routers is the, we attach to each router in the virtual topology a container, an IPsec container in this case, through which traffic will flow from the tenant network and through the public one and the same uh, the other uh, the other tenant, right? Now a little bit of information about what translations we do. So, for for what, whoever is not familiar with how VPN works in in Neutron and OpenStack, right? So when you create when you set up VPN in Neutron, what you do is first you create a VPN service, and in this VPN service you say what is the router on which we want to enable it, and what is the private network that for which you enable VPN. And then for every VPN service that you have, you create an IPsec site connection that tells what is the peer router and what is the peer network behind that router. So through the translation model I explained a little bit before, so we're going to create the service container and service container group. And of course, we also create a router port where we'll attach the container. And we're also going to add all the rules that are necessary to redirect traffic flowing through this router, such as, for instance, uh, clear text traffic coming from the private network would be redirected to the container, right? Such that the software running in the container will be able to encrypt it. But also, for instance, the IPsec traffic coming from outside, that is the blue traffic, as well as, for instance, the red Ike traffic that's necessary to set up the Ike security associations, right? So in the end, we're going to end up with something like this. So with having in blue the clear text traffic that flows from the VM, from the instances to the router, gets redirected to the containers. And then in the containers, the, in this case, we use Libreswan. And the Libreswan software will encrypt it according to the configuration, send it to the peers. And this is the red traffic, the encrypted traffic that we see. So for this demo, I have here OpenStack. You, you can see my, my virtual topology. Let me know if it's not big enough, and I can make it bigger. And we also have the uh, two instances. One of the two instances is actually over there, right? So here I'm logged in into, let's say, with the instance connected to the Mercury network. I can see its IP address, right? In this case, it's uh, 192.168.12. And I, for instance, try to ping, let's say, the second instance, right? It doesn't work because they're both in private networks, behind routers. And in order to make it work, what I have to do is enable a VPN connection between them. So for this, uh, first, I'd like to go, I have here, uh, let me try to make it this bigger. the three hosts I showed you previously in my physical topology. So on the top, I have the controller, and then the other two computes on the bottom. So on the top, because I have running the Minonet controller here, I can start. Uh, uh, we have our own, let's say, uh, CLI to interact with uh, a southbound model. This is needed for now, at least, because you don't have access to the container models from directly from Neutron yet. right? So here. 
we can see the three hosts that we have running. And I, I try to emphasize a little bit information about the, what's related to the containers. So we see here that we have the three hosts. They are live. And we, we also have some uh, container configuration that we can set up later. And this is needed, for instance, when operators apply, they want to apply policies uh, for the container services. And now, if we try to list the number of containers, we see that we don't have any at the moment. So to set up VPN, let's go back to Horizon and see here I already created, uh, not to waste any more time, the Ike and IPsec policies. And let me now set up the VPN. So for this, for instance, I'm going to set up a VPN service for the Mercury network. All right? I'm enabling on the Mercury router, and the local subnet is uh, 1, 0, slash 24. I'm going to do the same for the Venus. And now at this point, both VPN services are in pending create mode. That is because, uh, let me try to make this bigger, are in pending create mode because we haven't yet set up the IPsec site connections. So for this, we go to the IPsec site connection tab. And here, it is where we configure the peers. That is, for each VPN service that we added, we configure to which uh, peer site it should connect. So the first one would be Mercury, let's say, to Venus. Sorry. So we enable this uh, connection on the Mercury router. We use the policies that we defined. These are just policies with a default configuration. And here we enter the IP address of the peer router, that is, the Venus router. And the last step is to say what is the peer subnet, that is the subnet behind the Venus router. In this case, it's 192.168 and 20 slash 24. Oops. And a pre-shared key, let's say my secret key. So. Now we, we can see that the VPN service for the Mercury site is in uh, active state. And if we go back to our CLI and we list the containers, we can see that we have one container running. So uh, this container is uh, an IPsec container that is uh, given by its type. We can see what's the port that's corresponding to the container. So we created a new port for it. And also the host where it has been scheduled. So for example, if we list from here the routers that we have, so we can see that the router one is the router for the Mercury site. We can see that we have an initial port uh, that is connected to the container, and this is the port that is plugged. Right? So when we did the translation from the neutron model to the southbound model that we use in Middlenet, we created this new port for the new service container. And we connected this port to the router, and we connected the container there. So now let's do the same. Add a new side connection between Venus and Mercury. So this is on Venus. We use the same policies. This is connected to the Mercury router. And the peer subnet is 1, 0, slash 24. And the same pre-shared key. Hope everything is the same, so it works. So now the second VPN service is in active status. And if you go back to the middle net CLI, we see that we have two containers now. So one for each VPN service, because we have two routers. And uh, the second container, in this case, is running on host one. So let's hope the ping works, and I don't have to redo this. Yes, so now the ping works between two sites. Right. So I'm going to leave it 
uh, running for now. So we, we see we have two containers on different compute hosts. So if we list the hosts, so host one is compute one, host two is compute two. So I said that one advantage of running the, or of implementing these services as containers is it, when there is a problem, it's easy to simply move the container from one host to the other host. So let's try to do that now. For example, let's go to compute two, where we have container zero, and let's stop the agent running there, right? So the name of the middleman agent is middleman, so I'm gonna stop that service. And let's list the containers again. And now we can see that one container has been migrated from host two to host zero. And if we go back to the ping, we can, still, we can see that's still running. Now, there may be a couple of packets lost. Uh, this depends on your environment. In my case, my laptop here is pretty slow, especially with 12 gigs allocated to running uh, OpenStack on all these computes. So you, you'll see that the TTL is quite high. And it also depends because you use JVM on having a warmed up JVM. So normally, the packet loss and uh, failing over the containers uh, should take very little time. But when I'm doing this the first time, usually it takes a little bit more. Now, I said that another thing uh, interesting about using containers is that we can allow operators uh, uh, to easily manage the way they deploy services in the network. So whereas uh, scalability, high availability, is that we allow you to, for instance, use the same computes. So for instance, as you add more capacity, uh, providing the services simply scales out. And when there is a problem, we can simply transition containers from one host to the other host. We also can provide operators with, for instance, uh, features like policies. And as I said previously, in our controller nodes, what we do have is this container service. And part of the responsibility of this container service is to handle the container uh, scheduling. That is, choosing the compute host where we run these containers. Now, uh, in the current implementation we have, so this is a project that we started about uh, four or five months ago, is that the controller nodes coordinate between themselves in a sort of active passive way. So uh, we only have one controller node running at a time, but if there is a problem where you take it down for maintenance, another controller node just takes up the scheduling function and they, they are also uh, restart tolerant. So you can restart it and nothing in your scheduling of the existing containers will change. If controller nodes are down, the containers won't be supervised if there is a problem, but otherwise, when you start a new one, you simply see where the containers are and just work. Now, one of the, of the functions of this container scheduling is, of course, to determine where we run these containers. This is one. The second is, if there is a problem and a container, just a particular container has a problem, we want to fail over that container to different hosts. If a host is down, we also monitor the host status, and if a host is down, then we take all the containers that you have there, and we try to migrate them to different hosts. And finally, we want to allow operators some granularity in manipulating these containers. So, for example, we allow uh, an operator to perform, let's say, per container scheduling, that is, say I want this container to run at that host, also to apply some uh, scheduling group policies. What kind of policies? Well, one type of policies is affinity policies, and these tell us to which, groups, to which group of hosts we can run a certain container. And for example, we support anywhere affinity, where you, you choose from all the hosts that you have available in your cloud from all computes. We also uh, have right now implemented host group affinity, and this will allow, for instance, to choosing from a certain subset of hosts. And 
probably even more, let's say, uh, important for certain types of containers is port group affinity, where you have the possibility to specify that uh, the, con the um, compute host to which containers should run are tied to whether some ports are located there. And this is, for example, useful uh, when you have, let's say, containers supporting BGP, right? You want to run your BGP containers at your gateways. And the gateways are defined by where you have your uplink ports. If you move your uplink port from one gateway to another, for instance, when you take a certain compute down for maintenance, then you'd like also that the containers that are there to migrate to where the uplink port goes, right? So when you use uh, port group affinity, you simply say, I want my containers, my BGP containers, to run where my uplink ports are. And then as these, for instance, uplink ports move from one host to a different host, the containers would also migrate to, with the ports. And in addition to, of, to the affinity policies that we support, we also added some selection policies. Now, uh, because this is a young project, uh, what we've, uh, we only have added two so far, and probably the first one was simply a weighted policy, where you just uh, are able to allocate a weight metric to each compute host and say what is the probability that host should be chosen to run a container. And where the metric of zero means that we should not run a container there. So, for instance, we'll see during the, the demonstration that when we set the metric to zero, we can't run a container, the container will be migrated. And, oh, excuse me, I also ha we also have a list policy, in which case this is a live policy. And the list policy takes feedback from the hosts and tries to allocate containers to the hosts that have the fewest number. So, let's start our ping here again. I just want to demonstrate a couple of these of these policies because we don't have a lot of time. So, for example, if we list the containers now, we see that we have uh, one container running at host one, the other container running at host zero. Let me start the third uh, compute. And in the meantime, let's say I want to take host down host one for maintenance, right? And I only have host zero left. So, what I want, what I can do is simply proactively migrate a container, container one in this case, from host one to host zero. So, for this, it's, host, it's container one, we simply set host, host zero. And we can see that uh, the container has been migrated. Now, just at the moment when I uh, entered container list, it was in starting status, and we see it hasn't been allocated. It's in the interface yet, but if I'm refreshing now, you see the container has started, and you see there what its uh, network interface. And we can go back to, to our ping here, and the ping is still running. And in terms of Policies, I, I told previously that we control policies through the container groups. So right now in implementation we have at the moment, we create a new container group in a translation for uh, every VPN service you create. So now we see that we have here two container groups and the policy is the list policy. Right? But for example, we can change this policy to weighted for certain containers, and then we can see how this policy will affect the containers. So, oops. So let's change the policy for both groups to weighted, and. In order to apply a certain weight, for instance, let's say we have uh, we have here our host list, and we want to make host two the host with a higher container weight, right? So let's make, for instance, list this host ten thousand. And 
let's say we don't want to run any containers. The host zero is for controller. We want to stop running containers there. So what we can do is we take host zero, we set its container weight to zero, and we expect, of course, this is probabilistic. The probability of choosing a certain host is weighted by the value that we entered, but it's not by any means certain. And this is the other policy, or the other policy is what will allow flexibility for this. So now we should migrate containers from host zero to any other host, and the scheduler should choose a host based on the policy that we entered and according to the weight. Right, so we can see that now both containers are, are running at host two. The ping is still is still going, and if we go to host two and we list the interfaces, then we see here that we have these are the interfaces where the containers are connected. Right. Now I'd like to. I'd love to show you some more, but unfortunately, I also have to leave a couple of minutes for questions. So of course, there are many other policies we can think of. We implemented only two. We didn't have time to add more. If you want to try it, uh, so everything in this release is open source. You can just, uh, you have to set up your own OpenStack environment. We have on millionet.org a quick start. You just uh, it's a script, you download it, you run it. That's what I use to set up my uh, OpenStack environment here. You can download packages uh, for 5.1, that is the, because the, the quick start script is for 5.0. So for 5.1, you'd have to uh, download and install packages, but it's quite easy from builds.org. And of course, if you run into any problems, uh, get to us on Slack and we'll try to answer them. So now, I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah, um, good presentation, thank you. So can you elaborate a little bit on how you got Neutron to integrate with those containers? Yeah, so we haven't worked uh, on the Neutron side yet, anything related to this. So the idea was to, for now, was simply to leverage the southbound model that we have and use that at least initially, in order to implement these containers. So the, our idea was, for instance, to support VPN in, in Midonet, right? And in addition to this, we thought of all these challenges related to high availability, scalability, and giving the operators some control over where they run, for instance, this third-party VPN software. We use LibreSwan, right? But you could use Quagga, for instance, for BGP or whatever. So, that is how we started with the idea of containers. That is, let's wrap these applications as containers. They don't, let, don't make them full VMs because they don't, maybe they don't need to, right? They don't need full isolation. So we leveraged the southbound molds that we had to implement this initial version at least, right? And this is what we had so far, and this is how we did it. Of course, maybe in the future, uh, this is, these ideas are a bit separate from the containers work they're doing now in Neutron. So it's not the same container orchestration, but it's more related to, let's say, encapsulate as containers certain services. Of course, it's very possible that this could be taken upstream, you know, implementing in Neutron and adding support for it in Neutron. But it also, for now at least, in our version, it depends a little bit on the kind of code that we have in order to orchestrate these containers, that is, schedule them, get uh, status from them, health checks, and so on. Thank you. Hey, <coughs> Alex, fantastic yeah. presentation. Thanks. Just some really neat um, capabilities. Uh, you may have said this, and I might have just missed it. The policies that you're able to enforce and the scheduling that you do, are you leveraging any other um, open source schedulers, or have you guys written that yourselves? No, for this one, we implemented ourselves, our own scheduler. All right, so if there are any more questions. Oh, excuse me.
So I think I've seen, this is the third session with a similar idea. Um, and so far, no one's really thought of what the API, or I haven't seen any ideas on what the API from Neutron might look like. Um, do you have any thoughts? Have you thought ahead about what you'd like to do? Would it be something you want to let the tenants do? Is it something you'd reserve for the site operator? What are you thinking about, about how the tenant would engage that? So initially, we thought this would be uh, a, at least an operator site because um, probably for the, for the tenants, this would be the service. They don't ask for a container in this case. It asks for the service, and the service is uh, VPN or firewall or whatever. For them, the, the fact that behind there is a container that would provide them, let's say, 99 point something availability, it should be transparent, right? But for the operator, it's not. So probably, of course, it would be, it would be awesome in this case to have some neutral support for it. So uh, in this case, the operators shouldn't go to our CLI to manage them. Uh, we haven't put any thought in, in an API for this yet. As I said, the, the project is pretty young, and uh, we, it started from a need of implementing VPN. It, it wasn't just uh, driven by uh, we want to have containers. Uh, but of course, we'd have to think about it. I don't know if you uh, explained this. So the, these containers provide the network service. How does it interact with the middle net agent on the individual host? There you do the packet simulation, right? I just want to know what's the, what's the integration. So at that layer, it interacts with, with the middle net agent in the same way a VM interacts. The only difference is, is that uh, because we have this uh, richer, lower layer models that we use, we just uh, tell the agent what kind of transformation it needs to, to apply. In this case, for instance, the, what we needed to tell the agent was that, uh, hey, for traffic got coming from the private network and going to the na network to the peer network, just route it to the container. And there we have the container, we have Libras1 while running, and Libras1 has been configured to know that packets going between these two networks they should be encrypted with this configuration. And the configuration is the one you, you set from Neutron. But otherwise, from the agent side, is just as a VM. So there is no difference there. It is the transformation in the model that's important, not uh, the agent. We haven't done any work on the agent to do some particular SDN operations. Okay, okay. okay so if there aren't any more questions, we're out of time anyway. Thank you very much for attending this last session. <laughs>